Welcome to Unlocking Moves, where we take you inside the key decisions and pivotal moments that really unlock the potential of successful entrepreneurs and leaders. We're going to cover not just the glory stories, we're going to cover the gory stories, because as I like to say, the bigger the shit show, the bigger the lesson. And speaking of shit shows, my first guest for my first episode is Rod Kurtz, my good friend who not only helped me collaborate on my book, Who's Your Mike? He's also a entrepreneur in residence at UCLA. He is a um, senior editor at American Express and a former big wig at Inc. This guy is legit. Welcome, Rod, to my Virgin episode. If you say so, I'm legit. Hey, speaking of Virgin, we're going to talk a little bit about your relationship with Richard Branson, but I want to start I, I thought you were going another direction with that. <laughs> I want to start a little bit further back. Your very first job with when you were a student at the University of Pennsylvania, you worked for the Daily Pennsylvanian, and you had a very, very spicy uh, article about some rigmarole between Ben Folds 5 and The Roots. Tell me what the hell that was about. You know, you're going way, way back in the archives there. And and uh, those are some some old band. I guess the roots are more current than Ben Folds 5. But uh, yeah, I mean, I cut my teeth at the Daily Pennsylvania, did a ton of stories, had a lot of adventures. I think, uh, you know, that one stands out. But for me, I think even though I, I rose to be the, the managing editor, which is essentially the editor of the whole paper, uh, for me, the highlight was actually being crime reporter, because back in the late 90s when I was doing it, West Philly, where Penn is, is no joke. Uh, there was a lot of crime back then. And I think I've, I've told you over the years, uh, one of the highlights for me was uh, going on some ride alongs with the cops wearing bulletproof vests. And certainly I didn't have to do that with the Ben Folds 5 story. But it was it was a really enlightening experience for me. And I think, you know, it was formative for me. It convinced me I wanted to be a journalist, whether it was covering something like a music story, which was for our spring fling or crime, or I was editor during 9-11, which was formative as well. So I think we all have those uh, kind of early moments where you think you're going in a career direction and it convinces you that's where you want to be. Rod, you didn't answer what the hell happened between Ben Folds 5 and The Roots. You're testing me. I do not do not remember, which uh, it's always good to start with a, a stump question here. Well, there you go. I'll give you a little bit of a, of a tip. So evidently, Ben Folds 5 and uh, The Roots were going to show up at the Spring Fling, which yep, is a college uh, deal. And uh, evidently, four or five or six years earlier, they got a little into a spat because Ben Folds 5 threw an, a microphone in the audience to celebrate and hit several members and damaged them uh, of the audience, including some members of the Roots. And the next five years, they were back and forth, like always <laughs> kind of giving each other shit. And then when they showed up on the same docket for uh, for the spring fling, evidently there was a the police didn't want that happening. Well, this just shows what a crack research team on Locking Moves has. You you stumped the first guest in the first episode. I, I did not recall that. So well, I uh, I appreciate the the refresh. <laughs> Evidently, this wasn't your unlocking move. So no, definitely not. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> Thanks for the trip I, down memory lane. There you go. Well, Rod, I consider myself a uh, uh, an advocate for the listener. I want to ask the questions that the listener wants to know. I I, I kind of teased a little bit the Richard Branson a bit. I know you've got a special relationship with Sir Richard Branson. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, it's it's a relationship I'm, I'm so blessed to have. Um, and it dates back over a decade at this point. And, and you're sort of teasing one of my unlocking moves. But basically, I was uh, an executive editor at AOL launching a new website for them covering entrepreneurship. And I started to put together uh, this idea for what I ended up calling the board of directors, where I wanted to bring in about 20 or so entrepreneurs from early stage startup to, you know, very well established. And as it started to come together and I got such a great response to this idea of just posing open ended questions to a regular group of entrepreneurs and getting their feedback, I thought, you know, who's the pinnacle? Who's the entrepreneur's entrepreneur? And I, of course, was familiar with Richard Branson, had followed his, his uh, journeys across the world and basically, you know, started to figure out who do I know that knows someone who knows someone who knows him. I uh, ended up connecting with his longtime director of communications, who's a dear friend to this day. And I essentially started courting her. I said, you know, I'm Rod. Here's what I'm putting together. I want to foster these conversations. Every entrepreneur I know looks up to Sir Richard. And it was like months and months of convincing them I wasn't crazy and I had a good idea here. 
And literally the the night before we were about to launch the new site, we were still waiting. Is he going to be part of this board of directors? And I get an email that he's in. And we were up all night launching the site. And there was just absolute elation that he had signed on to my idea. And from there, not only did he become a regular contributor of mine, I actually traveled with him literally all over the world. We've been to London together. We've been to Liverpool together. We've been to Jamaica together, New York together. And he's just a, I, it sounds cliche, he's just such a nice guy. And I think the thing that always strikes me is that he's just inherently curious. Even at this stage, he owns his own island. He could spend the rest of his days in his beloved hammock there with his, you know, flamingos and lemurs and all that. But he's always looking for the next best idea. One quick anecdote is the story I always tell uh, about him is that we were on a uh, flight going from New York, uh, I think it was Newark to San Francisco. And this is dating me a little bit, but uh, it was the day he joined Instagram. And one of the great things about Virgin is they're always trying to tell the Virgin story and anything he does, they try to turn into kind of a media event. And I had been on charter flights with him before where it was just, you know, virgin people and invited guests. This was just a regular domestic flight going out to San Francisco. And he walks on the plane at the very last minute. And I realize all these passengers have no idea the owner of the airline that was Virgin America at the time is about to get on the plane. And the minute we took to the skies, he gets on the PA and you know welcomes everyone and starts walking down the aisle with a tray of mimosas. And I'm thinking to myself, this is how you create customer loyalty for life, where the owner of the airline has given you a mimosa. And we're sitting on the flight and I'm sitting next to him at one point. And a flight attendant kind of sheepishly comes up to him and says, you know, Mr. Branson, I'm sorry to interrupt your breakfast, but the passenger in seat 25A wanted me to give you this. It turns out it was a business plan. This person way back in the plane said, here's my opportunity to get my idea in front of Richard Branson. And I think to myself, like, he's eating breakfast. He doesn't want to deal with this. He literally puts his fork down, opens the envelope, and starts reading it. And that, to me, just underscores that curiosity that it was probably nothing. But he thinks maybe it's the next great virgin business. I don't know if I if I don't take a look. And so I always tell that to entrepreneurs because he's at the pinnacle, and he's still looking for big ideas. So you should, as an entrepreneur, stop and take a look at some of those ideas. Dude, I love that. I love, so many things uh, from that story I want to uh, touch on. One is uh, you had the balls to go out and and reach out to Richard Branson and keep reaching out when you didn't get the answer you wanted. And this guy on the plane took his opportunity, your gal, to reach out to Richard Branson and pitch their their deal. Who knows if it uh, amounted to anything? Maybe he stole the idea and, and now, uh, you know, Virgin Space is, uh, is, is his idea. Who knows? Um, but then I'll also have to ask you, have you been to Necker Island, the private island in the, in the uh, you know, I mm-hmm. haven't, I've been invited there. There's sometimes a price tag that goes with it for their, their foundation, which I, I still can't quite foot the bill, but I have been invited, but a very cool thing we did was, uh, I was down in Jamaica with him a couple times for the launch of the Branson center of entrepreneurship, uh, in Jamaica. And when I was there for the launch, it's essentially an incubator for Jamaican entrepreneurs. And I thought, I've got this board of directors, this great group of American entrepreneurs. And we ended up putting together a summit where I brought down my group of entrepreneurs to essentially mentor uh, the entrepreneurs at the Branson Center. And I just remember, you know, I was I was sort of putting this together behind the scenes. It wasn't I, I wasn't working for Virgin. It wasn't on behalf of, of who I was working for at the time. I just said, this is a great idea. I want to do it. And so I remember being at the hotel. You know, we had coordinated this over email and conference call. And just all of a sudden, you know, my group of entrepreneurs showed up and I was like, I can't believe we pulled this off. This is amazing that you're all here. And it was it was to this day, probably one of the most rewarding experiences of my career. That's awesome. So Jamaica is not a, a bad runner up to Necker Island. It's not. I will tell you this. I have been kicked off of Necker Island. I was down there a couple of years ago uh, and I, I, we took a, I took a kayak or paddleboard over to the island and was trying just to see what I could see and, until the security guards uh, you know, got me the hell off the island. But um, I didn't go to jail or anything like that. So it's all good. But you gave me another follow up question, Rod, and that is for all the listeners out there. I think you just assured me or guaranteed that Richard Branson will be my next guest on Unlocking Moves. Is is that right? I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do. If you're just joining us on Unlocking Moves, today's episode is brought to you as usual by Hire Better. 
the strategic talent partner for growth-minded entrepreneurs everywhere. So, Rod, next question for you. You were a big collaborator, and I don't know if I can give you enough kudos and thank you for my book, Who's Your Mike? A No Bullshit Guide to the People You'll Meet on Your Entrepreneurial Journey. We, uh, in that book, as you know, we, we archetype about 12 uh, types of characters you're going to meet. I got to ask you, which one's your favorite character? Well, and I, why? I, just, I just so happen to have a copy here. So shameless plug. Uh, no, it was uh, talk about favorite moments. I mean, I think this collaboration we did on the book was also a career highlight. I think the the notable thing, and, and we've been working together for years at this point, um, we did it all virtually, which is kind of cool. A lot of people think, uh, you know, how do you go about writing a book? And I give you credit for sort of putting together our little team. And, and I think the the diligence that we show just week after week after week of having these kind of organic conversations to get to the right answer with these characters. Uh, I, I, I feel duty bound to point out I'm in the book. So can I be my own favorite character? There or, you go. Perfect. Yeah. HR Rota. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the question is, are we talking about the cartoons or the characters themselves? I think for the cartoons, which is a real fun part of the book, if you haven't picked it up yet, uh, I got to go with Harry the Hustler. He looks like half the guys I see in L.A. with the double <laughs> finger guns and the ridiculous sports car. Um, you know, the thing that I, I think is cool about the book is that, you know, all the characters have merits. I think the even though the the solution and how to deal with each of them is a little different and what they bring to the table is a little different, that they all serve a purpose over time at the different growth stages of your business. And there's really no one in there that you're outright like, let's get rid of them. They have no value here. I like right hand Rita. I like side hustle Sam. He might be the next Richard Branson, you know, with a little nurturing. I think, you know, especially for the purposes of this conversation, kicking things off, I, I got to go with Mike because he is so universal. I've I've been doing this for over 20 years at this point, the first 10 as a journalist covering entrepreneurs and the past 10, you know, as an advisor to entrepreneurs. I don't know anyone who hasn't had a mic. And I think that's why, you know, he's the title, why you let off with him. It's so universal. You know, in your case, it was sort of a college buddy, but everyone has employee number one. And the thing I respect about Mike is that he's the guy who's going to break his back for you. He may not be the best at every role, especially as the company matures, but everyone's got that employee number one. And I think that that work ethic, that loyalty, that's something that you can't really teach. And even if the role outgrows him, I think he's someone you always want to have on board. But I think the the message to, to our audience here is, and, and this isn't a shameless plug, pick up the book, read that first chapter about Mike, and I guarantee it's going to resonate with you. And I think from there, all the other characters, even if you haven't encountered them just yet in your journey, chances are you're going to. Well, thank you for the shameless plug. And uh, I, I agree with you. Every entrepreneur, either everywhere where you can buy books. And hey, that was an OG version before we made the bestseller list. So I was going to say, you, you're or... too humble to say it, but people should know this has been a USA Today bestseller, a Barnes and Noble bestseller, hit number one on Amazon startups list. So I, that's been obviously a, a rewarding part of it too, is just seeing how this has been resonating with people. And, you know, I think what you're doing here is, is, kind of carrying that conversation in, in real time with people who uh, have experienced some of these characters. This, this part, part of, of uh, Unlucky, Unlucky Moves is brought to you by, by Rod Kurtz, Kurtz and his picture. Right, right, right. right. And I don't even get a cut. Hey, uh, so the next part I want to ask you, I want to ask you about your Unlocking Move, but I think you've uh, kind of covered it. Is there anything you want to add about like the big key pivotal Unlocking Move for you? You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about this uh, this week leading up to to our shoot here. And obviously, I'm familiar with the concept that, you know, unlocking moves, what we mean by this is, you know, those pivotal moments where you really unlocked your potential uh, as an entrepreneur, or whatever it is you do. And two of them came to mind. One was that moment I recounted landing Sir Richard as a contributor. Um, but I, I worked backwards and I thought, you know, I've been blessed in my career, honestly, I've traveled the world. I've met literally thousands of entrepreneurs who have inspired me. I've had some great conversations. I've I've been on national television for well over a decade, and uh, you know that that's always a thrill being able to to reach millions. Um, but I thought, you know, what what for me unlocked some of my moves, and I think it was kind of that realization that 
you have these moments where as an entrepreneur, you realize the sky's the limit, that you can literally do anything if you, you know, cliched as it may be, put your mind to it. So I, I worked backwards and I thought, when did I have these realizations that you can, as an entrepreneur, just keep going and going and going? Sir Richard's an example of that. Like I mentioned, he could be retired at this point, you know, living his life on Necker Island, but he's always looking for the new thing, you know, space, the final frontier. He's, he's going to space. And so for me, I think it was landing him as a contributor, realizing if I reach out to Sir Richard, all he can do is say no. And his nickname is Dr. Yes, which is why I have a feeling he signed on. But there was actually a, a very early moment for me that I think set my whole path, my trajectory in motion. And it goes way back. I, I think I was about 13 years old and I was always a writer. I was always that kid in the backseat of my parents' car with a notebook trying to come up with a short story or the next great novel, whatever it might be. And when I was about 13, I'd have to check the math, uh, you know, big sports fan growing up. And I had a short letter to the editor published in Sports Illustrated. And I remember on my AOL account, sending it to, you know, Sports Illustrated at AOL.com. And I knew then that they wanted something short and pithy. I was trying to not game the system, but do my best to get in the magazine. And I think it was my my very first attempt. And they ended up publishing it. And I just remember that being the coolest feeling in the world that, you know, and this was back when Sports Illustrated was the Bible of, of sports magazines and, and magazines were still a thing. And I just remember like going to the supermarket with my parents that week and picking up a copy and seeing my name there. And then we went to, you know, CVS or whatever and picking it up and I could see my name there. And very early on that showed me kind of the, you know, the power of the press, the pen is mightier than the sword. And it just, I almost got a high from it. I thought I can share my ideas with people on a wide scale and they're going to read it. Like what's cooler than that? And from there, you know, was editor of my high school newspaper, editor of my college newspaper, I uh, had internships at the New York Times and elsewhere. And then, as you know, my very first job out of college was at the Austin American Statesman. And I was just off and running. I just loved, you know, being able to ask questions for a living, being able to share my writing for a living. And I gravitated toward entrepreneurs. I wound up, like you said, at Inc. Magazine, and that that was it. I was in. I was ready to go. And here I am today, you know, over two decades later. Rod, I'm going to touch on a couple of things you just said, because you really just inspired me. And I hope you inspired our audience as well. Your unlucky move was before you went and talked to Richard Branson. You had the balls and the courage to go write, uh, write and re reach out to Richard Branson. You also had the courage to reach out to Sports Illustrated. I can't tell you how many times I read Reader's Digest with those funny stories and submit your own story or Reader's Digest and want to become, I wanted to be that guy, but I was too lazy. I didn't have the balls or the courage to do that. You did that. And so it's just inspiration for others to, to reach out and take that step and not wish and hope that, su that su uh, success happens, but take your own uh, success in your own hands. And just to add to that, um, an expression my my beloved grandmother used to use, and I use it to this day, and I think it you know it really applies to every entrepreneur. And and my grandfather uh, was the consummate entrepreneur, which I think is how I got this in my blood. She used to always say, "Go to try school." That you have nothing to lose by trying. And to this day, I can't think of a better piece of advice for entrepreneurs that you literally have nothing to lose. All you can here is no, and you got to kiss a lot of frogs in this world. And, you know, that sticks with me to this day, whether it's, you know, reaching out to Richard Branson, I would say another unlocking move was my relationship with American Express, which was almost started by accident, where we had a meeting and they were looking for something entirely different. And I just had this idea literally on the subway going to see them at, at World Financial Center and kind of pitched them this idea of, you know, I could be your editor at large. I could do this. I could do that. And I'm thinking they're never going to understand this. It's corporate America. I'm coming in with this, you know, harebrained idea of, of what this relationship would look like. And to my pleasant surprise, the, the head of the group I worked with uh, at that point, you know, slammed on his desk and said, I love it. When can you start? And I'm like, OK, you know. I tried this and it worked. And, you know, to this day, I still work closely with them. I love it. Well, that's why we started Unlucky Moves, Rod, because we wanted to, uh, to uncover some key things that really unlocked the potential and the success of others. 
Well, I want to sort of flip the script, given that this is the first episode. Um, you know, people should know that in addition to the book, we've been working together on the development of this. And when you sort of pitched me the idea, I loved it right away because, you know, the reality is there are so many business podcasts out there. And, you know, so many of them are once upon a time or tell us about your first million and, you know, success, success, success. And I know from, you know, covering this for years as a journalist that the the most informative lessons, I think, are from some of the stumbles and some of the outright failures that I think people are conditioned not to talk about. And it's, you know, the reality is if you're on this entrepreneurial journey, you're going to stumble. It's not a straight line that you're going to have to zig and zag and there are going to be boulders in the way. And I'm always most interested in, you know, how did you overcome this? So I'm going to hijack the show here and, and kind of interview a little, interview you a little bit about uh, you know, just the genesis of this. Where did the idea come from, uh, and and essentially, why did you want to launch this amid a sea of other podcasts? You know, it's a great question. I've always had this uh, this mindset that we learn more from our stumbles, as you said, and from the shit shows than we do from all the success. And uh, even in the book, I talk about uh, I don't want to hear about your five steps to your billion dollar career and having sex on the beach every day or whatever. I want to hear really how you got there, the, the things you had to overcome to, to accomplish that. So I thought, what better way than to try to not only uncover those, uh, those missteps, but there's always one or two key pivotal moments that can make your career. They don't always break your career, but they can make your career. So that's really the genesis. I wanted to understand for you what turned you into becoming, going from a, you know, just a routine daily Pennsylvanian kind of, you know, reporter to UCLA entrepreneur in residence and editor of Inc. Magazine. Those are those are big things. You don't get them just by happenstance. You have to take some bold moves. That's really why why I wanted to start this. I love it. And, you know, I think what really cemented our relationship, I, if my memory serves me, we started ser uh, working together, I think it was 2019. And then, you know, not long after, we all know what happened, the world shut down. And, you know, I was really struck by how, uh, you know, we were all locked down. We were all, you know, wondering what the hell this was going to look like. And you just started fostering these conversations among entrepreneurs. And I, I don't think you were looking for anything out of it. You were just like, all right, we're all kind of, you know, in pause mode here. Let's bring people together, almost group therapy, see if we can kind of crowdsource solutions. And so I think this podcast is is sort of the manifestation of that, that you've been having different conversations, whether it was over LinkedIn, whether it was over Zoom, and now you're kind of bringing people together in a formal way. What what can the audience expect, you know, not only from the guests you've got coming up, but, you know, from these conversations, what do you ultimately want people to learn? Is it having them look inward and see what was my unlocking move, or I haven't found my unlocking move yet? You know, what do you, ultimately, it's always about the audience. What do you want the audience to get out of this? Yeah, you know, my, uh, my, purpose in life is to challenge and inspire those around me. And so if I can challenge you in a one-on-one -on -one conversation over a, you know, lunch table or coffee table and inspire you to fulfill your, your, your own purpose, then I've done my job. But if I can take that to a broader audience and have an effect of exponentially impacting people, then now I'm really living my purpose. So if I can inspire you by asking Rod challenging questions and, and uncovering those unlocking moves for him, then it can inspire you to do the same. So you're going to, from each guest, you're going to learn something new, hopefully something off the wall, like we started with our first question. And I've got a couple of other secret questions I want to ask you later too. Fair. We'll, we'll close on that. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to let you get off the hook. I, there are a couple personal moments in your bio I want to hit. Um, I guess first, you know, this is a, a more serious one, but I, I think uh, a turning point for you, an unlocking move, if you will, was buying higher better a lot of people associate you as as the founder which i i would argue you are of of the current incarnation of higher better but talk to me about why that was sort of a turning point and and i would say kind of set off you know your trajectory here well if you don't mind let me take you a couple steps back because if i think about things that really unlocked my potential they were much earlier the first one well i've got a ton of them because i've been so blessed in so many ways but one of the biggest ones for me was when I, I, I went to University of Arkansas and I was, I like to tell people I was just two points shy of a 4.0 average. And most people say, oh, 3.8. 
No, we're talking closer to the 2.0, right? And, uh, you know, most people wouldn't admit that, but hell, we're here being authentic. Um, so I was, I was, I was really good student in high, in high school, but when I got to college, I kind of blew a bunch of shit off. Plus I started my own business, which is my excuse, but let's not uh, use that as an excuse. My key moment after all the rejection letters of all the different companies who didn't want a 2.3 or whatever student was when I studied my ass off and I passed the CPA exam. Then I used my really, my real God given gift as a connector. And I reached out to some friends I knew who worked for Ernst and Young. And I was just fortunate enough to get an interview with Ernst and Young. And once I got that opportunity, I went from a 2.3 or four student at Arkansas to a now a CPA at Ernst and Young, which man, that talk about, you know, putting jet fuel on your career. That was huge for me. So very fortunate, but I also created my own opportunity and my own luck. The other was uh, really relevant to the book and to my entire career and really my success prior to Hire Better was uh, at, at the controller group, which was my previous company. And we had a, a tremendous success. My unlocking move was being introduced to Brett Lawson, who was my next level Natalie, if we're going to use some of our uh, verbiage from Who's Your Mike. He was my operating partner. I didn't know it at the time, but we complimented each other. I was the visionary outward, you know, facing sales guy. And he was the run the business expert in what we were doing guy. And the two of us, and we added another partner, Kathy Schrock, were just unstoppable. And we had a great run and ended up selling that very successfully. So those are the key unlocking moves even before Hire Better. I like it. I like it. And I, I think the through line, not only of that story, but the book and, and frankly, most of the entrepreneurial stories I've seen and told is people. You know, some of this stuff you just can't teach. You've got to have those instincts. You've got to learn. You know, I know entrepreneurs who aren't necessarily natural people, people, but they, they learned, um, you know, their strengths and weaknesses as it relates to that. And I think, you know, you hear so much about technology and AI and chat GPT, it's going to be people, you know, for the foreseeable future. Some of the, you know, uh, intangibles uh, never change to me that you've got to have a good team in place. You got to have good people, you know, all rowing in the same direction. And, you know, that's just something you learn over time. You know, I certainly had people who work for me, I have people who work for me now. Uh, and it's it's about getting people on board with that mission. So I'm not surprised that you've sort of built on that success. And and as we always talk about, and as it says on the book jacket, you know, you're a natural connector. I like to think of myself as the same way. And and I think our relationship is is a symbol of that. That we connected through a, a close mutual friend, uh, someone we've both known for years. And I I always had this idea of concentric circles that you want to start with the people closest to you and kind of work your way out because. Uh, I do believe uh, it's one of my favorite expressions that I always mangle it, but you know, water finds its own level. I find that good people gravitate toward good people. And I think that should always be as an entrepreneur, your North star, because you can teach them the skills, you can teach them uh, you know, how the operation works. But if you're not connecting on that, as you say, H to H human to human level, you know, you, you've got a, an uphill climb. So speaking of balls, I, I heard something that I'm not sure I believe, though I think you're crazy enough to do it. Did you go running with the bulls? Oh, the answer is yes. And okay. I'm so dumb that I ran it twice. Okay. Live to and tell the tale. <laughs> I did live to tell the tale. So when, first of all, if you run with the bulls, here's 15, 20,000 people doing this and uh, probably four girls. So if you're a, a father, do not send your daughter, wife, girlfriend, anybody to run with the bulls. For multiple um, reasons. Imagine, exactly. Imagine a New York City Marathon combined with you know, a, a, a big um, drunken fest, right? Is, is what it was. We spent the night before we ran trying to figure out how to run. And there's a smart way to run, which is what old smart guys generally do. And then there's a show up on ESPN way to run, right? <laughs> So what you see on ESPN is kind of at the end of the run. It's a only a 500 yard run. And that's where people are kind of effing with the bulls. And um, why that's so dangerous at the end is because the bulls get spread out because they're running on cobblestone streets, taking hard turns. When there's five of them running together, they're relatively safe. When they get spread out at the end of the race, that's when you get gored because you're effing with one in front of you while the one in the back is, go is goring you. So we learned that you're supposed to get at the top of this first hill, which is about hundred yards in and walk 
run towards the bulls because the bulls are coming up this way and all the crowd is running towards you and we're supposed to run towards the bulls. Well, the first day I kind of got a little bit nervous and I started running with everyone else and I kind of ended up, I, did, I was disappointed with my effort, let's say that. And one of my friends who was supposed to run with us we didn't know we were going to run because um, we were supposed to run the next day. Long story about that. But he, he well, the next day, he's like, oh, shit, I wanted to run. And he's like, well, OK, it's no, no problem. You run. And uh, none of my other friends would run with him. And he was scared shitless. So I ended up deciding I wanted to prove to myself I could do it smarter and better. And I wanted to run with my friends. So I did it twice. I did it, I think, kind of smart. But honestly, there's nearly no smart way to run with the bulls. So uh, well, I'm glad I, I did it. I don't have to do it again. I was going to say, you gave me the how. The journalist in me wants to know the why. Why would you do this? I'm, I'm a um, don't challenge me. I will figure out a way to do it. And it's not always the smartest decision. So um, just ask my wife. I'm not the smartest. Uh, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. Well, and it's it's an allegory for the entrepreneurial journey. Sometimes you get gored, but if you're smart, exactly. you avoid the bulls. Perfect. I like that. Well, I will hey, not Rod be joining you on any of those future trips. <laughs> well, I've got a lots of other stories of stupid shit that I've done. We could talk about it at some other point. Well, now you've got a whole podcast series to get into it. There you go. Hey, Rod, as we wrap up this episode of Unlocking Moves, I've got to ask you, what is one question that no one has ever asked you, but you kind of wish they would, or maybe secretly you wish they wouldn't? One question that people don't ask me, um, that's a tough one. Um, it, it's interesting for me because I'm usually the one asking the questions as you know, a journalist and an advisor. Um, I think that one I get occasionally, but I would say I don't get often enough is, you know, what is it about entrepreneurship? Should I do this? And, and if so, why should I do this? And the two things I always fall back on is one, you know, when you're starting and growing a company, especially for the first time, um, you get out of it everything you put back into it. If I'm up all night working on a proposal for a new brand I want to work with and they sign on and, you know, that first check comes in the mail, it's like I created that. And there is a high that comes with that, not about the money, just that I'm literally creating something from scratch based on my ideas, based on my experiences. And that's you know a rewarding feeling that you just don't get working for someone else, that you could bust your ass and maybe you'll get a raise or a promotion, but at the end of the day, you're working on behalf of someone else. And I think that's the coolest thing about entrepreneurship to me is that you, know, you have a chance to create something from scratch. Uh, I think the second thing that that goes along with that is you learn every single day, and I know you can relate to this, that even if you think you've reached a pinnacle of success, whatever you have it in, in your head as being, that you just learn and learn and learn, whether it's dealing with people, which you outlined so well, and who's your mic. Uh, you know, for me, it was little things like, oh, I know how to redline a contract now. Like, what, when the hell did that happen? But, you know, negotiating and, and managing relationships and, you know, pursuing growth and putting together a team that can help you get there. Uh, it's just a constant learning experience. And, you know, it's not without its challenges. I mean, it's a 24-7 endeavor. You can never truly punch out, but I've been at it over 10 years at this point. And I like to say, I, I feel like I'm living every story I ever told as a journalist. And I think that gave me a leg up having known so many journalists or known so many entrepreneurs who could help me make that leap from, from journalist to entrepreneur growing up in a family business. You know, that was uh, you know, helped shape my thinking on, on all this early on. So uh, I think you want to wait till you have the right idea and, and the resources in place and, and maybe don't take a flying leap, but dip your toe in the water. But I think it's just such a rewarding experience. And, and as you'll get into in this series, even the failures can be rewarding. Even the stumbles can be rewarding, sometimes even more so. So uh, that's something I, I wish I could talk about more. I, I wish more people asked it because uh, you know, that to me, once you understand that you've got a foundation for going out on your own. 
Well, I wish you hadn't discouraged people from leaping first because most entrepreneurs <laughs> leap first and then figure out what the hell, what the parachute is going to look like on the way off the cliff. So yeah. uh, uh, I was hoping for something a little bit more awkward and a little more embarrassing, <laughs> um, but you, you provided a good answer. So on that note, let's end Sorry this for episode. being constructive. <laughs> on that note, let's end this episode of Unlocking News. Rod, thanks so much for being my guest. My pleasure, Kurt. Great to see you. If you're an entrepreneur and you think you might have outgrown a member of your team, or maybe you've got a mic, as we talked about in Who's Your Mic, check out this quiz at whosyourmic.com slash quiz. That's whosyourmic.com slash quiz.